Welcome to the Inspiration North podcast, inspiring stories from inspirational people and how they found their passion, their true north. I'm James Eaves. And I'm Michelle Minikin. And this is the Inspiration North podcast. Today's episode, start with what you want and plan how to make it happen with Laura Cook. We talk about how a strong female leader as a boss opened her eyes as to what is possible. No matter what size of business, there's always stress around money and how the path of scaling rapidly doesn't suit most businesses. Laura is a business finance strategist for business owners who are ready to get serious and bring their CFO hat to the table. Through her one-to-one strategic intensives, on-demand trainings and honest blog posts, she's there to help you set up the strategies and systems you need to simplify the money piece, get the best ROI and calm those mindset monkeys so you can finally feel financial freedom. Her customers have called her refreshing and honest and one woman called her a total money expert tied up with a ribbon of mindfulness and gentle calm. When she's not empowering business owners, you can find her limbering up doing yoga, having one too many chai cup of teas or with a paintbrush in hand. Meet Laura Cook and get ready to be empowered at lauracook.com. So, Laura, welcome to Inspiration North headquarters on a very windy but sunny afternoon. Mm. So, first question is, did you know what you wanted to be when you were a little girl? So, when I was really little... I can't say that I had exactly an idea of what I wanted to be when I was when I grew up, but I would say that looking back, I would have expected and had more tendencies towards probably wanting to be a vet Mm -hmm. or working with animals. I had I was one of those kids that you just saw an animal anywhere, and it was like I had to run up to it. Mm -hmm. It was like a sheep, a cow, whatever it was. It was like I just need to go and see that animal, Mm -hmm. Um, and rescuing wildlife and feeding the birds in the garden. Really obsessed. Certainly as I got a bit older, and I don't know if you remember, I think it, this is what it was called. I think it was called Animal Hospital with mm-hmm. Rolf Harris. Yeah. Mm. I remember I'd watch that and just be in tears. And mm. I'd be like, I just was like, I actually couldn't cope with seeing the injured animal mm. or any animal cruelty and things like that. And I kind of kind of felt, I think, as um, I started to get a little bit older, that actually I just couldn't stomach it. Mm. Like for all that I really wanted to spend time with the animals, it just, I think emotionally it would have just destroyed me. And I'm still a huge animal lover now, but yeah, that, I don't think that that would have worked out for me as a career. But yeah, when I was really, really little, I, I think that's what I would have would have said I would want to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember even like when we were like 16, I don't know if you had them too, we had those career advisors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I remember you had to like fill in the questionnaire, what you likes, what you dislikes, and out mm-hmm. popped the first thing on my list was to work for the RSPCA. Okay. And I was just like, well, that's not really going to happen. And I certainly, there were kind of expectations. You're going to go to uni, you're going to do all these things. And I was like, that's not really my path, I guess, where I'm headed. But what I found really funny is like four years ago, I ended up being a treasurer for the RSPCA. Oh, cool. So it did kind of come full circle that I did actually end up for two years, I was working directly and supporting on a voluntary basis, the animal welfare charity. Oh, so it did work. The questionnaire. <laughs> it did work now. <laughs> We've got living proof. That's great. Didn't always work for no. quite a few people. We've Still not a probation to. officer. <laughs> it's not my lifelong vocation, but <laughs> yeah. I was meant to be a, a PT instructor in the army or a merchant navy deck officer. Oh, well, what? Yeah. That sounds my like fun. Mm. Yeah. Didn't happen. No. I've travelled a lot, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's for, it's a different <laughs> podcast. <laughs> so what, what changed then? So you got to choose your sub- subjects to go to A-level to study. How come that didn't involve something with animals? Um, I think when I was that age, I wasn't really consciously thinking about what is the impact of these decisions. Mm-hmm. I was very much like, what am I good at? And what am I kind of, what comes easily to me? And pick those kind of subjects, but also mm-hmm. with a sense that being academic and achieving was kind of valued in the family that I was growing up in. Mm-hmm. So my parents didn't get the opportunity to continue education and then put, go through university until older in life. So mm-hmm. I remember them going to university when I was young. So they put them back so, themselves through that. Mm-hmm. So I knew it was like there was kind of this external awareness that going to uni, academia and the way I guess the school I was I was at was orientated was very science based, mm. and business was kind of a big thing as, as well then, 
I've always kind of been someone who's like, like I got really good grades. I can't deny I didn't get, I got really good grades across the board. Mm. So it wasn't like there was necessarily anything that was particularly obvious either. Mm. But I did end up going down a math and a science route. Um, and I loved it. Like I love science. I love um, mathematics. I love solving problems. And I just kind of headed that way. And with an unawareness that I hadn't picked biology, which would lead me into something mm. like that. But mm. with kind of a, almost a sense that I'd thought by that point, it might be pharmacy or something like that. Mm. Mm. Worked my way through A-levels and was like, actually, chemistry was incredibly difficult. Yes, and it was. <laughs> I, did, I did chemistry A-level. It was really, really hard. <laughs> it, was really it was all about awful. moles. It was like almost biology. <laughs> <laughs> it was really awful. I mean, I loved, I did, I was fascinated by it. And we made our own paracetamol, which I thought was amazing. Mm. They wouldn't let us try it, but we made our own paracetamol. <laughs> so what I really realized was actually my brain doesn't remember facts very well. Mm. My brain's incredibly good at solving problems. But you ask me to remember facts, which is what chemistry needs you to do. Mm. It's just too hard for me. So mm. I kind of realized that that wasn't working then as well. And so it feels like it's all been a process of elimination yeah. of what kind of works, what someone I'm naturally good at, and then what, what can I do with that? Mm. Um, and that kind of led me down a route of into a degree which was around accountancy and management and business. So mm. it wasn't pure accounting. It had this huge um, element around kind of leadership and management and business in a, in a wider sense, which was definitely felt like that's the way we should be going. Mm. <laughs> like as a cohort of people at that age, mm -hmm. that's, that, that's the route for your career. Because I knew like languages were also encouraged, but I was like, I can't remember. I just can't remember the words. So mm. I wasn't going that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a funny one. Yeah. I did languages or pay levels. And now I was quite good then. It's been like a while. And I understand the words when they're spoken, but I, you know, having to translate them in my head to translate them back out through my mouth, it's mm. like too hard. But yeah. I'll get there. I'll get there. Yeah. I find <laughs> languages interesting. It's like I could, I could read them. Mm. I could sort of speak them with a pretty good accent. Couldn't understand a word anyone said back to me. Really? So it's like, yeah, I could go and like the, the, we went to France, we went to Germany, we went a couple of places. Mm. And it's like, yeah, I was really excited to like order something at the restaurant and then I'd say it and they'd really be convinced I, like I had a good accent. <laughs> and even when I went to Paris a few times, I'd always been like, oh, they, they know you're English and they will respond to you in English. And I mm. actually got them to speak back to me in French, but then I had no idea what they were saying. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I just tripped myself up straight away. <laughs> Funny how brains work, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I could have, I could have, me and you together would be great, wouldn't we? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you could say the words, and I can tell you what the yeah the, what the they English said is. Back. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Perfect combination. There we go. Or <laughs> well, we just take James, and he can do all the talking for us because he can speak through in French. So yeah, <laughs> it's cheating though, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so whereabouts are you at university? I went to Leeds University. Okay, okay. And what was the university life like? University life, oh, it feels like a long time ago. I really enjoyed it. I was very conscious of choosing a university that was like where I had to move out and move away from home because my brother went to Durham mm. and he ended up staying at home. And I was very much like, I just need, I need to get away. Mm. I need to feel like I've kind of um, moved away, create some independence. So for me, it was a lot about that. Um, and it's not too far Leeds as well, is it? Right. No, exactly. It's not too far. That it's like a, an hour down the road, just a bit further. I can easily... Um, borrow my mum's car and like nipped down and took that for a little while and yeah. then trains and things so it was really it was convenient from that perspective not too far but I guess I was the first one in my family to move away like that mm. which was which is kind of good I enjoyed it the university life yeah it feels like because I am someone who was very academic so I was always like very diligent academically but then sort of the first year was just like crazy you know mm. just like all the nightlife all the busyness um, <laughs> a lot of people I went to school with like from A levels actually went there. I think there was thirty of us there. Oh, crazy! Which was quite nice mm -hmm. in a way because you were like, oh, you'd always see a familiar face mm -hmm. pretty much every day, even though we all really dispersed mm -hmm. and like just found our own groups and our own people. Um, but it had that kind of nice familiarity, and mm -hmm. with it being in the north, and it still had those lo lovely Yorkshire accents and things like that. I just it just felt like a home from home kind mm -hmm. of place. Yeah, oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. So, what was next? Um, so from there, I clearly set my path on an accountancy management um, inside a business kind of career. Mm. So the natural progression there was to then get my professional qualifications. Yep. Um, so it was really just an extension of the degree. Um, but I very much knew I was like, I need to get them done really quickly because as soon as I get out of this pattern of doing exams and things like that, I'll never, ever want to do it again. Mm -hmm. 
So um, I went straight into it. So I ended up getting a full-time job. I came back to the Northeast, got a full-time job, got the uh, where they supported my training into um, to pay for that, mm-hmm. to do the professional qualifications. And that took me two years to do all the academia, but you needed at least three years experience. So mm-hmm. it took three years to do that. But I ended up bizarrely finding this job through the job center, mm-hmm. which is like insane looking back, to work for like this company, it's called PPG Industries, which is like a, at the time was like a Fortune 200 company. Mm-hmm. And it gave me so much opportunity. Like I just didn't expect to find that on the doorstep, like mm. 15 minutes down the road from where I lived. And I ended up from there just completely traveling the world with this job, mm-hmm. um, which I'd never expected. It was never really on my wish list. Mm-hmm. But for me, it was it was just huge in the sense that it 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 took me out of a, quite a sheltered life mm-hmm. to just really expand like my worldview and see different places and how different people lived, and I just loved it. Like I can't say I didn't love it. Mm-hmm. Um, those kind of first sort of six nine years, I was in that company, stayed in that company for nine years because the opportunities just came Mm -hmm. and I just got so much out of it that that's kind of what kept me there that kind of opportunity to learn to do different kind of projects to work in different cultures to 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 support teams in different places and Mm -hmm. to just feel like I could like integrate into that Mm -hmm. yeah it was lovely so why aren't you still there so (laughs) we can ask that question no I was gonna ask another one okay (laughs) why am I not still there I think it got to a point where I very much recognized I didn't want my boss's job. Mm. I, in the time there, I had three bosses. The first one was um, a lady, and I think she was quite impactful on me in the sense that she was a very strong female leader in the organization. And that kind of also opened my eyes to what's possible. Like, Mm. I worked in very male-dominated manufacturing companies. So to be like a young blonde woman in your 20s, trying to kind of make these things happen and make change happen, you kind of, you know, it's mm. it's not like you're suppressing yourselves, but you're operating in a way that maybe isn't always natural. But she kind of was this huge, huge role model for me. And she was kind of like, you need to, like a sense that, that your career and your choices are a game and mm. you get to choose what they are and you get to have more control over what they are. And I think that started to open also my eyes up to what, like I have a lot of choice here. I don't mm. have to stay in this kind of career. And I'm somebody who love has a thirst for learning and I think I'd learn everything I could. Mm. I was like, I've kind of got everything I can out of this. Mm-hmm. And I don't want my boss's job. Like two or three bosses came in and I'm like, nah, I don't, I don't, I don't want what you're doing. I don't want to have to relocate to the other side of the world. I don't, I don't want to work these hours. I don't want to not see a family that I'll have eventually. And I was just like, mm, if I don't want the next level, then, then I need to go, go somewhere else. Mm. I need to choose a different path. Uh, but I didn't exactly know what that was. I didn't know if it was um, to just change company, which would give me more opportunity to learn. But I also knew that I'd been traveling a lot at that point. And I was like, I need to sort of stop traveling. Mm. Not because I didn't love it, but because I wasn't building enough friendships and relationships and connections locally. Mm-hmm. So I'd started to go really disconnected from where I lived mm. and felt like actually... I guess it's that phase in life where I was like, I just need to kind of cultivate more of that in mm-hmm. the local area and more be more at home. So I ended up taking the decision to change companies. Um, I also looked for a company that felt like it had a lot more purpose behind mm-hmm. it. So I moved over to Draeger, which is in the Northeast in mm-hmm. Blythe, which um, they develop equipment, which is around life-saving equipment. So I loved their mission mm-hmm. and I went there and... Um, Again, it, there was a there was a lot to learn, but I kind of felt like there wasn't enough to satisfy me for a really really long period of time, mm. and the commute was just a painful. Lot. Yeah, and I think mm. you just learn a lot, and I just became very very aware that um, I'm somebody that's I have a lot more energy when I'm kind of in smaller groups of people, or when I'm on my own, or when I'm not doing lots of commuting, lots of traveling, and and a lot of it was around. I need to create a way of working for me that Mm. fulfills my thirst for knowledge Mm -hmm. and for helping people and has a purpose, but also supports me in the sense that I don't get drained and worn out and burn out from everything. Mm -hmm. And then that's when I decided really that an actual career being employed where I never want the boss's job is just absolutely not for me. Mm. And I need to go and figure out what that is. Um, And at the same time, I got a lot 
into, I did some personal coaching with a coach and I got really interested in uh, Gallup Strengths Finder, the mm-hmm. strengths training and trained with Gallup and just felt like things just were starting to fit into place. And I was like, I could start to see more of my strengths, start to see more strengths in other people. And I was like, there's a, there's a lot more I can do here and I need to go and explore that. Mm. We love the Gallup Strengths Finder stuff. Mm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so if, um, I did mine a couple of years ago, similar to trying to figure out what it is I'm good at. And James did it a while ago, but he's done his recently as well. So mm-hmm. excellent, fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have a really interesting offline chat about those. We <laughs> 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 don't want to bore the living daylights so everyone who's listening. Cause yeah. Yes. <laughs> have. But it was very fascinating. Highly recommend it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Were there any surprises then from what you'd, you'd been told in your report about what your strengths were to help you make the decision for the next step? Or did it confirm what you already knew deep down? So taking Strengths Finder, I'm not sure it was surprising. I think it was fascinating in the sense that it recognized strengths in a way that I didn't think about strengths. Mm. So for all like I've already been talking about, I know that I'm someone who needs to like loves to learn. Like I wouldn't have identified that as being a strength. Mm. I would have actually said that was that was getting in my way. Yeah, <clears throat> of, procrastinating. learning. Exactly, <laughs> that was getting in my way and it's almost like it reframed what I was doing and my behaviors and my natural tendencies mm. in a way that was constructive mm-hmm. and it gave me kind of a direction of how I can constructively use those. Mm. I'm definitely somebody who's like, I wanna know more about me and what I'm good at and find ways to use that in a good way. Mm-hmm. And so that, really fit well with me um, rather than trying to be like I can see somebody needs help with this I need to change who I am to, to mm-hmm. be able to help them mm-hmm. yeah mm. I think the one thing that felt probably because I don't know how much you know about the strengths or people that are listening that know about strengths is you kind of got the different categories the relationship building the executing and the strategic <clears throat> and the influencing uh, there was sort of more of a frustration that my influencing skills or talents were very very uh lower down the list Mm. so there was sort of a frustration around how can i how can i really help and support people when those those talents aren't there Mm. but then through the work i did you start to learn how do you actually use the talents you've got to create the same outcome but in a different way Mm. and i think that was really that was really Mm. surprising so instead of seeing like oh i can't do that thing someone else can do actually i can just i just do it differently well, you're interesting that you've got the same bottom five strengths. You too. Yeah. It's brilliant. Mm. <laughs> mm. It's all right. You don't need to worry about those too much. <laughs> no, it's funny. I was like, hang on a second. I was looking through the reports. It's like, hang on a second. These are totally this slightly different order, but exactly mm. the same five. So the my husband and I have, in our top five, our three are identical. Yeah, we've got some, we've got some similars mm. in, in our top mm. five. We've got... Yeah. yeah, my favourite top five one is woo. <laughs> I've got winning others over. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, this is why I come across like a Ribena berry. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lovely one to have. Yeah. That's one of my low. that's one of my bottom ones. So you can have a, have a natural tendency to be like, oh, I'm so jealous of people that have woo. <laughs> it's just so <laughs> effortless to them. It's like, ooh, people, <laughs> fun, hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then James has got his relator ones really high. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's just, it's, yeah, you get to know people really well. So mm-hmm. it's, it's lovely. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So what did you then do with that information? From there, from doing the strengths finder, all the, I did some, like I say, uh, personal coaching uh, to help me kind of understand what my next steps were going to be. I'd also kind of become a little bit, I'd started to develop this kind of perception that I didn't want to, help people make more money which mm. sounds I had started to develop this complex to some degree around that I've been working for these big companies mm-hmm. and for all they were doing great things I still had this feeling that it was about how do we make more money how do we improve the bottom line how do we how do we cut costs and maybe find cheaper suppliers or or push the employees harder and and it kind of like I developed this kind of mindset in my head it was like that feels wrong to me mm. And so at that point, I kind of didn't really intend to fully pursue um, taking those financial skills with me. Mm -hmm. Um, And I really wanted to support people, 
typically people like myself who come from a techno technical um scientific IT based background um who was stepping up out of that technical role mm. into management. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to use the strengths finder for that. What I found very, very quickly is that whilst I enjoyed that, I didn't, it felt like I was going backwards. I was kind of going back to those same companies mm. and just helping those people in a different way. And I felt like this isn't creative enough. It's not different enough. It's not stretching uh, me enough or um, it's not really having a fundamental change. Mm. So I kind of, after a, probably about a year of doing that independently, really started to bring a lot more of my accountancy back into it mm -hmm. and started to work with entrepreneurs instead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're a funny bunch as entrepreneurs, yeah. aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's either brilliant or really bad. <laughs> it's like nothing in the middle. Lots of shades of grey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What would you say some of the challenges are then that you see? In businesses mm. that I work with. So now I do work a lot. I do bring a lot more of my finance skills, um, a lot more of the strategic um, experience I have from working with businesses and the strengths finder and combine those. And I'd say it depends on the size of the business. They're going to have slightly different challenges. Most businesses I find... I, I tend to work with two types of businesses, I'd say, is a business that's struggling financially, and usually their challenges is they're not really paying attention to the money, um, and they're not thinking about the implications of what they're doing and how that's gonna affect the future. Mm -hmm. And that's not always a bad thing, but it can get people into trouble and you can get tripped up by that. The other kind of business I'll work with is a business who is um, growing quite fast, quite rapidly, or is looking to grow quickly, or is kind of expanding and bringing in more team, um, or needing to make big investments and, and take loans and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's helping them to figure out how do you grow without um, the stress of the money. Mm. Because I think no matter what size business you are, whether you're just starting out, you're kind of, you've been at it for a couple of years, or you're kind of a multi-million dollar business, mm. there's always this stress around money. And I think we bring a lot well, certainly I've experienced and a lot of the clients I've worked with is we bring a lot of these thoughts around money to the table. Mm -hmm. And that can have a huge impact. So our mindset on the decisions we're making can have a huge impact on what what's going to happen and whether they make an informed mm -hmm. decision or whether they're, they're making a very emotional decision and it's going to have some consequences financially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because as well, I mean, we meet lots of entrepreneurs, as you might imagine, not mm. just for podcasts in, in in both of our lives and the hats we wear. And it's quite, it can be a, a very lonely place as an entrepreneur. So you, are you typically working more with uh, the business owner or a, a, a more major stakeholder in a business? Is that kind of the typical person that you might interact with? Yeah, so I'm typically working with the business owner. When... As I'm sure you're both, both aware, especially when you start out in your business um, and for the first couple of years, your personal and your business like finances get really, really intertwined. Mm -hmm. And so it's not the same as when it's a really, really big, huge company and there's this kind of disconnect um, between there is a clear business and you're clearly getting salaries and you're paying this team and it's kind of separate. You can separate your personal life finances from your your, your um the business but certainly in those early days and it can be more challenging to, to to kind of look at those and look at the impact and and prioritize your own financial needs along the way so yeah so i'm working really hands-on with the business owner mm -hmm. depending on the size of the business then i'll support also the teams that they may have but really it's looking at how do we how do we how do i help them create a business that is financially healthy and financially sustainable, doing what it is they want to do. Mm -hmm. And just helping them to really see through some of the options and the scenarios so that they're not over-compromising themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think a lot of business, they can have kind of, a lot of business owners, all, especially in the early days, will prioritize the business over themselves. And sometimes it's really good to just have that external person to kind of go, if you do that, you realize you're going to, sacrifice this for yourself mm -hmm. what if we think about these options and you could mm -hmm. try this instead mm -hmm. and it's just helping them see through it because I think people I find people that either jump on decisions and they'll make lots of decisions really really quickly and maybe haven't thought it through or 
I'll work with business owners who are scared of taking the decision and they may delay making a decision and it could be like they could feel like they've wasted a year not moving forward but staying in this state of financial stress. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's a difficult step, isn't it? Because mm. it's, and there's, we often talk as well, don't we, about you reach a certain level and then it's, you're stretched from a resource perspective and you say as a business owner, well, if I do that, I mean, we're having the same conversations. If I do this and, you know, I can do that element of the role and I'll take this role on. And instead of saying, well, actually, shall we, shall we budget for some external support in these key areas, which will free up the time, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. this will actually give us another five hours, another 10 hours in the week or whatever it is to actually grow, to find more contracts, to, to do whatever, get mm-hmm. get the word out there, build the brand, revamp the website, whatever it is. It's sometimes those decisions, because you're so invest, uh, invested in the business, mm-hmm. you're almost blinkered. Mm, to, yeah. t- and to have an external person to say, this doesn't make any sense to me, but let's work yeah. Let's work through this. Yeah, and often you need to look at those things in stages. So mm. there can be this feeling like, I need to do a website, I need to do a rebrand, I need to hire somebody, I need to do all of these things, but you can't actually afford to do all of them all at once. And mm. it's like, how do you decide which one to do first? Mm. And then if you choose to do that one first, okay, what? how many more clients do you need or what kind of value contract do you need to get to make sure you fund that? Mm-hmm. And then, and then like exactly like you say, how much time do you need to free up? And it's just working through those scenarios like systematically and step by step and chunking it down and, and putting a lot of, I wanna say a lot of logic behind it mm-hmm. because it's, we've, we've got so much emotion and we're so much so invested in it mm-hmm. that by putting that kind of logic and those numbers behind it um, and breaking it down somehow just calms the situation for people and they can just see much more clearly mm-hmm. as to which path they want to take. It's, mm. it, the word I, I probably use is control, isn't it? It's with that logic and you can see rationally, even though I'm like super excited about redoing the website, I know that I need to invest in yeah. a, a new system or yeah. a project manager or whatever it is. But it, yeah, like yeah, it. yeah. Mm. It, it, I, it, you, you're right. I guess it's bringing a set a great sense of control over what's going to happen and looking long enough into the future to know that the thing you're really excited about now, if it's not necessarily the priority <laughs> of the moment, yeah. we still know we're going to plan to get it done when yeah. X, Y, and Z's happened. Yeah. So you can still trust it's going to happen. Mm. And it brings, it just, yeah, a lot of people say it's incredibly refreshing and it, it yeah, to just think about it and look at it that way. Mm. And they can look more calmly and more rationally. Yeah. Mm. It's a skill as well, I suppose, that as an entrepreneur, we may jump into something we're very passionate about. It could be um, a, we're very creative people, perhaps. It could be in so many different areas, but we're not all skilled in everything. Mm-hmm. And we can't all be good at developing apps as well as <laughs> managing people, as well as uh, creating up great copy for for articles and blogs and then we can't all be great on video so there comes a point where an element of finance which is such a key role for keeping a business as a going concern you've got to reach a point of having someone that you know isn't it it's whether it's a friend a family member someone you bring in externally to say you know i just i just want to build apps or Mm -hmm. i just want to make pots and sell them I don't want to do my accounting. That's why I want to pay somebody to do this. Or do you see what I mean? It's mm. like a help me bring some rationality to this, Laura, please. Because mm. I'm a I'm a hothead. I'm sort of really emotional, and I love this bit, but not this. Mm. But I don't want to ignore it. You can't be good at everything. Yeah. No, no. And yeah, I think a lot of the a lot of the business owners I do work with are pretty creative types and very much ideas. Very much um, have a lot of passion over what they're doing. And it is, it is, it is about bringing that kind of other, other like head that you need into mm-hmm. the business to mm-hmm. kind of blend the idea and the creativity into other fact that there's a business structure and mm-hmm. we still do need to think about the money and we want your idea to like flourish and actually be sustainable for the long term. Mm-hmm. It's not about limiting you. I like, mm-hmm. I find a few people I speak to are kind of like, oh, I don't want to be limited. I don't want to have a budget. I don't want to be constrained. And it's like, I'm absolutely not for constraining people. It's like, I want to know exactly what you want to do. Mm -hmm. 
and I will help you create a way to make that happen. I will help like s- ensure that that business is structured in a way that that's re- that that becomes your reality. Mm-hmm. And I see it for myself as almost a creative skill as well. So absolutely, like I, I would, you talk there about um, you don't want to do your bookkeeping. You don't want to do those kind of maybe uh, more but might feel like tedious, repetitive tasks, especially if you're a creative person. And I would absolutely be like, as soon as possible, outsource those. Mm-hmm. Like, just just outsource them. Just get someone else to do them in half the time. Take the stress off your plate. But then it's th- it's also the added level of level of how do you how do you actually turn this into a business that's going to like move you into the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I like the idea of I think a challenge sometimes in in the startup space is there's always lingo of oh we need. We, get, we need to get to a point of scale up and then we're going to be, we're not the next Facebook, but you've got to grow this and have more products and more, and you think, no, I just want to have a business that actually, you take it from another perspective of, here's what I want to, here's what my, I want my life to look like. Mm-hmm. Here's where I'd like my family to be. I'd like to just have my house paid off or oh. I'd like to be able to afford to, to work in another country every couple of months yeah. or... I want to be able to afford such and such a lifestyle or have a certain amount of disposable income. What do I have to do to get my business to a point that that does mm-hmm. that? Mm. Yeah. I think that's another way of looking at And I think that's, that's, that's exactly the kind of ethos I bring to things. I find that there's a lot of like marketing and things that we'll read out there in the world that are kind of trying to pull you and push you and encourage you into, you need to grow fast, you need to scale fast, you need to mm. you know increase your prices, you need to um, add more products to the mix. And it's kind of like, okay, they kind of logically make sense to a point, but are they actually right for you? And it kind of it kind of drives me a bit insane in the sense that it feels like if you think back to a lot of us are brought up and and I've kind of alluded to it, this sense that you follow this career path. Mm. It's almost like there's this world being creative where this is the entrepreneur path that you should be following. Your expectation, you should grow, you should scale, you should have multiple offers. Mm -hmm. And it drives me mad because Mm. actually that doesn't suit most businesses and it's completely irrelevant advice for a lot of people and it confuses them and causes stress. And it makes them feel like they're inadequate yeah. as well. Yeah, it makes you feel like you're failing, you're not achieving. Yeah. And, I, and I, I, yeah, it drives me absolutely insane, <laughs> which is why I always start with what do you want? <laughs> what do you want? You want, you know, do you mm. want to work three days a week and you want to have this amount of money and you want to spend time with your family? Is that your priority? Right. Mm-hmm. That's what we need to create yeah. doing what you do. Or do you want to work yeah. full time, build a business that's going to sell in five years time? Right. That's what we're going to do. It's slightly different. Yeah. Because many people perhaps have gone through a corporate structure to say I hate I need to get out of this and the reason you set up a business is more flexibility mm, freedom yeah. but then if you're trying to create something which is oh, I've now got three offices and I've got 25 people to manage and this is why I got out of corporate in the first place yeah. it's yeah yeah it's a chance so I like that mm. and looking I've, at a different way of I've, um, here's the life I want and how can I I've get there I've supported a couple of people who've done exactly that mm. uh, they've, they've left they've um, set up like um, legal firms grown it to like 10 teams of 10 people and been like this is this is not what I wanted mm. and then basically chosen to like sell the business and go solo again because I, I have more free time. I make actually more money when it's just me. Mm-hmm. I don't have the stress of a team and that works for them and that's amazing. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's. I think we can easily lose sight of why did you start this in the first place? Mm-hmm. And I feel like that is a big piece of what I bring. Mm-hmm. It's not really just, let's make sure grow, we have scale, enough money. Grow, scale, grow, scale, grow, scale. It's like, what do you want and how, yes. how, how, can, I, how can we make that happen? And mm-hmm. how can I kind of hold you to what you want so that you don't get pulled off by all these yeah. shiny things? Yeah. Because you've told me that's what you want. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Shiny things are dangerous. They're very <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> we all get sucked into them to a point. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think, I think there's just, there is a lot out there which encourages us to do a lot of things that aren't necessarily right or, or right for us. I was at, um, I delivered a, a pricing talk yesterday and I was very, very conscious that I wanted to get across the point that selling something for a low price isn't wrong. It mm. isn't bad. 
yeah, I feel like there is this kind of culture and expectation that if you don't like if you don't keep increasing your prices, if you don't sell at premium prices, there's something wrong with you. Mm. But actually, you can have a really successful business selling things at a low price. Mm-hmm. You just need a lot more customers. Mm-hmm. But I think it's it's really getting lost and confused in the sense of people's worth. That if it's just a low price, then like you're not worthy. There's something wrong, and I, and I hate that that kind of culture is like really spiraling out there. Yeah, it's it's all that comparison being the thief of joy again, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's just like, well, you know, Bob up the road now got her for his well, his or her Bob could be there, couldn't it? The fourth office, they've got a hundred people working. Mm-hmm. It's like literally my idea of nightmare. Mm-hmm. You know, I when I was working, I ended up putting one of the team in charge of the sort of management so I could do the leadership because Mm -hmm. the the management of other humans, I just found excruciating. I just wanted to almost play and sort my customers out and, you know, do projects and the fun stuff. It's just managing people. It's just, I don't find it particularly fun at all. So (laughs) it's, yeah. So how do we, how do we scale a business where you don't, don't have to have that direct management? And I think we've answered it, I suppose, in in psychology practice. So we kind of see it as crews coming together to deliver a project and then they disband. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, Yeah, it's kind of a network of associates. Lean lean structure, which... And I think it's around, you don't have to scale. Like, who's telling us we have to scale and create this massive business? Mm. Um, it's right for some people and it's it's not necessarily right for for others and yeah if if managing people isn't necessarily something you want to do and you get no joy out of it and it's actually more stressful then then why do that Mm -hmm. why not look at how you create something that works yeah Mm -hmm. i'm intrigued to know a bit more about uh the element of mindset when it comes to money as well Mm -hmm. not something um i guess we yeah i read a few things but what kind of factor do you think that has on somebody's life personally business you work for someone you're self-employed what do you reckon yeah i think mindset plays a big part often for people really subconsciously i think it affects it affects how comfortable you are like as i guess as an entrepreneur it affects how comfortable you are making sales pricing what you do how much you'll spend how easily you'll spend money so I think there are definitely, there are different kind of ways that it is portrayed and you'll see it. I think when you become an entrepreneur, the patterns and ways you're operating around money become much more exaggerated. So you probably, when you're employed, you don't notice it so much. I think there's something quite stable in having that consistent salary. When you're employed, the way I guess it'll show up is you may overspend or you may never kind of spend on yourself. And that they're definitely emotional reactions. So a lot of it stems, I guess if I I think about myself, a lot of it stems from childhood and how we've grown up around money, Mm -hmm. how we've seen our parents demonstrate um, their kind of connection to money. And for me, it's like I didn't grow up in a house where we had nothing. I had kind of sort of everything was there, but there were definitely times where money was tight. And I definitely saw it cause friction and um, arguments in our family. Um, And there were definitely times where I felt like I wasn't able to do something because we couldn't afford it. Mm. And in my mind, I started to associate a sense of, I'm not good enough. Like there's a reason why I can't do this. Like I don't deserve that money. So Mm -hmm. I can't do that kind of, I can't do that thing I want to do. Whether it be like extra, like I love love horse riding. Mm. I mean, I talked about being an animal lover, Mm -hmm. but that was really, it is a really expensive thing to do. And so it was very rare that I got to do that, but I always wanted to kind of do more of that. Mm. And I, I, there was just this really strong awareness that money was something we had to be really mindful of. We also, my brother and I were kind of um, given money when we kind of passed exams and things like that. Mm. So I sort of also associated money with achievement, a sense of, well, I don't, if I don't work hard enough, if I don't do enough, then I don't deserve to get the money. Mm. Um, If I don't get the money, then I don't deserve to do the fun things. Mm. So it's this kind of Mm. pattern of behavior that starts to develop. That's certainly my experience. And so the way that kind of role like is seen in my life is I'm not somebody who will spend a lot. Like I'll find it quite hard. Even now I'm being aware of it. It's it's quite hard for me to spend money on things that are just for fun Mm -hmm. unless I've kind of planned for it and I've got a budget for it and I've got a pot of money there ready to spend it so that I don't feel like 
I don't have to kind of worry about the emotional like letting go of it and am I worth that Mm -hmm. but I also see other people who are who are much more comfortable and freely spending money it's like they, they they feel really uncomfortable actually having money in the bank and as soon as it comes in it's gone it just completely and utterly disappears. Mm. And it's kind of like money feels unsafe. There's sort of a responsibility around it. And it's in it's it's sort of safer to have like to get rid of it and spend it than to kind of actually decide what to do with it. Mm. And so you can kind of see those patterns that that appear, like and you don't really see them happening. And and I never really it's not until I kind of look back and I've reflected a lot on this from my childhood and, and growing up and seeing my own patterns and these kind of really being extrapolated as mm. um, I've started my own business that actually that kind of stress and, and discomfort and wanting to kind of fix that thing about money and that kind of taking that stress away from people because I felt like the stress when we were younger, mm. I think really feel it feeds into where I have actually ended up even though I didn't consciously make the choices to do this. Mm. But it does play out a lot in entrepreneurship. So once you start your own business, those patterns become even more exaggerated, especially because your income is inconsistent. Mm -hmm. So the emotions then just go up and down um, Mm -hmm. like crazy until you start to see the patterns and start to go, oh, okay, I'm doing that again. How can I how can I look differently at it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it can affect the kind of business you'll pursue um, and the prices you'll set. So. For example, like I said, like I'm, I attach money to achievement to kind of worthiness. So I'll be like, if I'm not making enough money, then subconsciously, even though I'm very aware of it, there's still this kind of quiet chatter that, oh, I'm not worthy enough if I haven't made enough. So I, I've probably pursued uh, work that is, or more naturally pursued works that, that that's like well-priced, mm. I would say, and I'm less likely to discount and things like that. Whereas others I've worked with who have really struggled to put prices up. Um, so there's a lady I worked with and she works like with elderly people and she's she needs, she, she pays a team of people, minimum wage is just going up. And it's like, you kind of need to, you just need to pass some of that cost on because mm. you're you're not paying yourself enough. You're not mm-hmm. gonna be able to sustain this business. Mm. and. And she's got this kind of um, sense that she doesn't want to charge people. She feels really uncomfortable asking for the money and putting her prices up then becomes really, really difficult. And it's, mm-hmm. and again, I think it all gets wrapped up in our sense of self-worth and, and how we've seen money um, when we were younger. Mm. Fascinating. Mm. So with all your wisdom now, if we could take you back to your 18 year old self before university, what kind of advice do you think you would give it's funny because I was asked a very similar question the other day and I thought a lot about it and I was like actually no matter what I say to myself if I go back and talk to myself when I was 18 I don't think I would listen to myself <laughs> Me neither. in all honesty I don't think I would pay attention I would in some ways I feel like there's an element in me that's very stubborn and very rebellious I would mm. choose to do the opposite Mm-hmm. <laughs> so so what I feel like I would go back and do is almost I would want to go back and just give myself a really big hug and help myself to feel like I wasn't on my own like I wasn't mm. in it on my own mm. because yeah I just don't think I would have listened to myself at that time even mm. now I think you try and tell me something to do and, and it's not going to work <laughs> it's a good one everything will be alright because look I've come from the future so I've survived all these years <laughs> in between I like that that's oh, great. <laughs> so if somebody has listened today and thought, ooh, interesting stuff, I'd love to talk to, to Laura and uh, and work with her, you, um, what, what's the best way to get in touch? Um, yeah, so you can find out more about me at laura-cook.com. I'm also on uh, both Facebook and LinkedIn um, as Laura Cook. Yeah, so they're the best ways to get, get hold of me. Awesome. Mm, I enjoyed it. Yes. Good, fascinating conversation. Lots to think about mm. now, though, it's a problem. Yes. So. <laughs> 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 yes, it's one of those podcasts where you have to do lots of reflecting afterwards. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah I do. I do feel like I, I'm a deep reflector. So. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, thank you ever so much for coming yes, to visit. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Check out all the show notes at inspirationnorth.com. Join us again for the next episode when we'll be chatting to another inspirational person. If you like this, subscribe and tell your friends. If you didn't like this, 
subscribe anyway and tell everybody. <laughs>